Some of Britain's most glorious places are surprisingly hardly known, so I'd like to introduce two little villages, one almost on top of the other, nestling in the folds of the North Devon coastline. Inspired by the steep-sided wooded valleys, the Victorians called this the Little Switzerland of England, for they knew that one needed time to absorb the charm of these twin villages. And thus, Linton and Lynmouth became holiday destinations for the more discerning. Here, the East and West Lynn rivers meet, then become one with the Bristol Channel as they complete their journey from the high ground of Exmoor, a vast, unspoilt territory that beckons those with a passion for landscape and adventure. The Exmoor National Park is about 12,500 acres or so, so please excuse me if I don't show you every inch of it. Look upon this programme as the springboard for your own adventures. This gem of a spot is Tar Steps on the edge of the region. The stop here provides that gentle transition betwixt the hubbub of the M5 and the delights of Linton and Linmouth. Situated between Simon's Bath and Dulverton on the River Barrel, this is probably the finest ancient clapper bridge in this country, dating from at least the 13th century and perhaps prehistoric times. In some places within the National Park, three people together is considered to be a population explosion. Perhaps that's why Exmoor remains so special. Exmoor, with combs so deep, Exmoor with cliffs so steep. Exmoor with streams so bright. Exmoor's moorland coloured just right. Exmoor's ponies are so rare. Exmoor's sheep just stand and stare. Exmoor's hawks all soar above. The moor below all green and buff. To Exmoor's brush and bracken bidden, the red deer are so well hidden. Linton Town Hall is the starting point for a journey to some of our favourite spots. From Hunters into the West to Selworthy in the East, embracing such famous locations as the Valley of Rocks, Watersmeet and the Dune Valley. But we don't want to tell you where to go. Step inside here and see what's on. Be inspired. Perhaps you're of the mind that there's nothing more enjoyable and no better way to see Exmoor than a day's horse riding. There are many local stables that will ensure you'll have an exhilarating time. But the tourist information office can also help with accommodation, suggested walks and even fishing permits. The East Lynn was once described as a thoroughly sporting little stream for the fisherman who not only appreciates his sport but is a lover of nature as well. I rather like that sentiment. So, as a couple begin their adventure, so do we, by first embarking on a wander round the twin villages themselves. Here we see the entrance to the Cliff Railway, which, like the Town Hall, was provided by Sir George Newnes, Linton's greatest benefactor. We'll be walking down the coastal path, which zigzags over the Cliff Railway twice before arriving at Linmouth. Queen Street is the oldest part of Linton. It was built in a hollow because the winds here are predominantly west to northwest, and naturally enough, the inhabitants in early times wanted some protection from the gales. But Queen Street also leads to the veritable warren of Linton's back streets. Today, both Linton and Linmouth compete in best-dressed floral competitions. Seemingly, everyone joins in, even the chippy. 
blooming lovely. Alongside Pratt's Linton's best-known hotel is North Walk, the start of the path through the Valley of Rocks, or for us, a stroll down to Linmouth, offering our first glimpse of the famous Cliff Railway. A jolly little ride. The lattice bridges below are the course of our path down to Linmouth, Suffice to say that more people walk down than up. I, for one, can't blame them, as the railway itself is an adventure. More on that later. But for now, let's take in the super scenic views of the coast and of Fallen Point. Down on the breakwater, there's a head count of the local crab population underway, thanks to a successful little fisher girl. But it doesn't look like these crabs are planning to cooperate with anyone. It's a funny thing, but daddies aren't always so brave. Yes. I'm just over putting a bucket. Another escapee? No, not this time. This is the point where the East and West Lynn Rivers converge, their combined force changing the face of Lynmouth in 1952. But as the deck chairs are lined up for service on a beautiful summer's morning, it seems inappropriate to dwell on the events of one terrible night. For everyone is in holiday mood. The Rhenish Tower, the curious structure on the breakwater, has been rebuilt since the 1952 flood. It was originally provided to pump seawater to the spa bath of the nearby Bath Hotel. The top floor of the Flood Memorial Hall houses many models and pictures taken before, during and after the 1952 disaster. It is reached by the outside staircase. Come on, chaps. This is no time to rest. We've got places to go. As part of our trip to Hunter's Inn, we take to the water for a jolly to Woody Bay, about three miles to the west. This is what you will see on a pleasure boat ride from Lynmouth along the coast. The imposing cliffs between Lynmouth and Woody Bay are the highest in England and are alive with colonies of nesting seabirds such as kittiwakes, razorbills and guillemots. Even the wild goats climb down from the Valley of Rocks. The tiny pinpricks are people up on North Walk, between Linton and the Valley of Rocks. It all looks very different from up there.
As we round Castle Rock, the massive tor standing sentinel-like as the valley of rocks gives way to the sea, the first of a series of unspoilt coves appears, Ringcliff Bay. The almost conical tor towering above was moulded by glaciation, extreme hot and cold conditions breaking rock down to sculpt the valley of rocks into something truly special. Lee Bay is a mile or so further beyond the Valley of Rocks and is safe for swimming so long as you stay within the bay itself. It's good to visit at any time though, as the outgoing tide reveals lovely golden sand for children to play. Go on then lad, you know you want to. But us humans don't have exclusive rights to these waters. There are countless types of fish in the Bristol Channel hereabouts, and many boats from Lynmouth still go out fishing. This very rare species is a sunfish, enjoying a bit of the glorious Devonshire sunshine. Well, who can blame him? Although he'd best mind his head, here comes one of the Lynmouth pleasure boats heading towards Hedden's Mouth, or perhaps Ilfracoon. The bays are truly unspoilt along this stretch of coastline. The next one is Woody Bay, where Colonel Lake, a wealthy solicitor from Kent, having bought Martin Hoe Manor and inspired by the commercial possibilities offered by the forthcoming Linton to Barnstable narrow gauge railway, built a pier in 1897 where paddle steamers from South Wales could land their passengers. It began on this headland. But perhaps the idyllic tranquility of Woody Bay was divinely protected. For in a great storm of January 1899, the pier was destroyed, never to be rebuilt. All that remains today is the concrete platform jutting out into the sea. Down below us is Woody Bay Beach, which can be reached via a secluded twisting path from the coast road. Like many of the other bays along the stretch of coastline, it's a bit of a hike to get to the water's edge. But pick your time well, and you could have the whole place to yourself. Fabulous. We've now climbed from Woody Bay itself up to the coast road and are looking across to the South Wales coastline, a little over 10 miles away. From here, we'll continue west to Hunter's Inn, and once we have refreshed ourselves, we can either walk out to Hedden's Mouth or continue back towards Linton by road or along the southwest coast path.
Charlie is one of the pub's regulars. Alongside the pub is the route that takes you to Hedden's Mouth, a very pleasant walk of about a mile each way that ends at an enchanting rocky bay where there's a good example of a lime kiln. We, however, will return to Linton by the picturesque top road. looking east from above Woody Bay. Castle Rock stands guard over the distant Valley of Rocks, whilst revealed in the foreground is Lee Bay. Lee Abbey is just above Lee Bay, where we saw families swimming earlier. Apparently, nothing ever happened here, but uh, I wasn't planning on boring you with too much history anyway. As for Lee Bay itself, for those who don't fancy the undulating walk, there is a little grass car park nearby with a short walk down to the beach. As for the young at heart, intending to walk a little further, you're unlikely to be bothered by too many cars as you head for Linton. This stretch is a privately maintained road with a nominal toll for vehicle users. Just beyond the toll gate is the real treat on this particular walk, the Valley of Rocks, a must-see for any visitor to Linton and Linmouth. Some say it's the ancient course of the West Lynn River before it cut a new path through weaker rock to create the Glen Lynn Gorge and reach the sea at what is now Linmouth. May I suggest that you pause at this finger post. If you look to your left, you'll see the white lady with her bonnet and long white dress silhouetted between two leaning rocks. She's associated with the legend of Jennifer Witchhouse. Her story was told in Slain by the Dunes by local author Richard Doddridge Blackmore. Whilst in his legendary work Lorna Dune, the lovers consulted wise woman Mother Meldrum in her cave here prior to their marriage. From here, the coastal path continues towards North Walk, one of two routes available to us to re-enter Linton. But by returning along the road, you'll reach Poet's Corner. The majestic Valley of Rocks inspired Shelley, Wordsworth, Coleridge and Southey, and examples of their work are displayed within. We lay beneath a spreading oak beside a mossy seat, and from the turf a fountain broke and gurgled at our feet. No check, no stay, the streamlet fears, how merrily it goes. Twill murmur on a thousand years, and flow as it now flows. The Fountain, William Wordsworth, 1799. In 1891, Sir George Nunes paid for a field to be levelled here for a cricket pitch and pavilion. Not unsurprisingly, it's been voted Britain's most scenic cricket pitch. With Castle Rock dominating the landscape and the Devil's Cheese Ring opposite, there was surely no contest. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon, walking along in Linton, isn't it? <laughs> Come on, boys. Fern-lined paths litter the valley and some are perhaps a little on the undulating side. It keeps the locals young, although uh, some residents are well kitted out for the terrain. Wild goats have lived in the Valley of Rocks for hundreds of years. Folklore even says that if they disappear from the valley, bad times will hit Linton and Linmouth. So with this in mind, there's a goat society to look after them, although he looks quite capable of looking after himself.
Another Ice Age curiosity is the Devil's Cheese Ring. We complete our first round trip by returning via the main road to Linton Town Hall. But just before it is the United Reformed Church, a gift from Sir George Newnes to the non-conformists of the parish, of which his wife was one. Today, Sir George rests in the peaceful churchyard nearby. The publisher of Titbits magazine had moved to a mansion he had built on Holiday Hill to overlook the twin villages that he truly loved. But sadly, he died relatively young. To be diagnosed as diabetic was a death sentence in Victorian times. It's said that Sir George's gifts were for locals rather than tourists. The Cliff Railway, the Narrow Gauge Railway from Barnstable, electric street lighting, the cricket pitch, United Reformed Church and, of course, the centrepiece of Linton itself, the Town Hall. But the one thing Sir George opted not to give the villages was a pier for Linmouth. He believed that Victorian hordes would ruin this haven, and perhaps that vision was his greatest gift of all. For whilst other Devonshire seaside communities were irreversibly changed, Linton and Linmouth were that little bit more difficult to reach, and thus tourism was checked long before their charm was lost. Linton's ancient heart still beats, and appropriately, the oldest building is now the Lynn and Exmoor Museum, housing many small treasures from in and around the area. So now you've got yourself clued up on the history, perhaps it's time for our second round trip taking in Watersmeet and beyond the county boundary into Somerset, and of course, embracing Linton and Linmouth's famous Cliff Railway, an essential ride for all visitors. Near the railway's upper station, a local appreciates perhaps the finest view from any Devon town centre, as satisfied passengers, having just alighted from Linmouth, also pause to appreciate the vista and uh, probably how much energy they've saved getting up here. The Cliff Railway opened on Easter Monday 1890 and is still going strong. Using the area's natural resources to take the hard graft out of getting up from Linmouth. Martin Wilde. The Cliff Railway works on a counterbalance principle. Each car has two tanks carrying 700 gallons of water and when we're docked both tanks are full and the cars are in equilibrium. The top station is 550 feet above the lower station. We have 962 feet of rails and the incline is 33 degrees or one in one and three quarters. When we're ready to go, the car at the bottom drops off just sufficient water to enable the top car to become heavier. The top car then draws the bottom car up. No one really knows where the concept for a cliff railway came from, but in the 1700s, a letter in the local recorder suggested that uh, some form of water-powered lift should be used. And uh, in the 1890s, a local businessman and uh, London solicitor got together and decided to try and fund two or three developments in the area. One was the Esplanade, but the main one was the actual lift. This came into being in April 1890, and uh, was originally really designed for a freight lift because most of the products for the area came either from sea or overland by horse and cart. Both were time consuming and quite hazardous. When the lift first came into being, just being a flat platform, um, cements and things like this which were produced from the lime kilns in Lynmouth uh, were originally carried in this fashion. Later on the carriages which we're running in now were put on the lifts and uh, people were carried and of course the lifts didn't actually run to the same degree as they do today probably once or twice a day uh, now today we run them every six to ten minutes again back in the 1890s the lifts carried cars which couldn't make the steep hill 
uh, and the existing carriages were rolled off the flatbeds and the cars were rolled on in their place. At the present time, we are actually docking at the lower station. Right now, the two cars are stopped, one at the bottom and one at the top. The one at the top is proportionally empty of water and this bottom one is full. Right this moment, the car at the top is being filled with water to put the cars into equilibrium. Of course, if we were to load passengers on the top, the top car would become heavier and would start to roll down the hill, which is what we don't want. So we have a hydraulic braking system, which was patented in 1885, which works in reverse to the modern braking systems on cars of today. The brakes are permanently on until we go into motion. The cars incorporate what we term as the 1880 version of today's dead man's handle, and that is a brass hand wheel, which in fact releases the brake. So when we're ready to go, the drivers, after signalling, will both release the brakes by rotating the hand wheels. The cars will then go into motion, but should one of the drivers become incapacitated for any reason and was perhaps to collapse, then the wheels are loaded with lead and would actually unwind and apply the brakes. The bells that you've just sound were the drivers signalling between each other. The drivers now releasing water to make this bottom car lighter and we will release the equivalent amount of water to the weight of the people on the top. We're now departing from the lower station and uh, we will accelerate to a speed of approximately 15 miles an hour and the governors will then control that speed at a regular rate to the top. We have two sets of rails but they are mounted close to each other for whose cheapness of build originally and therefore we have to have an overtaking spot halfway up the rails. We're now just passing each other, so we're exactly halfway on the journey. The rumbling noise you can hear are the rollers, which are actually carrying the weight of the cables. Each cable weighs something in the region of one and a half tons, and there's two cables, so we're pulling something in the region of three tons of steel rope behind us as we're going up to the top station. The water comes from the Lynn Valley River. It's tapped off about a mile and a half to two miles up the valley and it's fed to the top station reservoirs by the original culverts which were built in the Victorian times. We store some 250,000 gallons in underwater tanks and uh, contrary to a lot of people's views that we are aiding and abetting the, the drought problems that we often get, we don't because of course the water from all the rivers ends up in the sea anyway, so all we do is borrow the water for a few hours, we put it in the tanks, but when we discharge water at the bottom of the railway, it goes directly into the sea, which is where the rivers would go anywhere. The fascinating thing is that the actual intake from the river is only one foot above us as we currently stand here, and the pressure that we use to fill the reservoirs and everything is used by a hydraulic effect, and we have three small reservoirs between here and the intake in the river and therefore what we actually do is we fill a, a reservoir with about 50,000 gallons of water and then that gives us the added pressure to pump the water up the hills to the reservoirs where we stand today. In the 1800s of course there was no mechanism that we use today and uh, every bit of the pipe work and the reservoirs and indeed the track bed here was all built by hand using spades and dynamite and if we were to attempt it today much of what we see here would be almost impossible to do because people don't do it by hand and actually bringing equipment in to do it would be exceptionally difficult uh, and uh, really expensive and in fact we gave um, uh, some assistance to a company in Greece who were planning to build a similar type of railway on a private island out there and to build a railway of this size and nature the, the estimate two years ago was about seven and a half million. Passengers alighting at the bottom are but a few steps from the Exmoor Visitor Centre where the bravery of Linmus Louisa lifeboat crew is justly remembered in a display including the sister boat to the Louisa herself. Back in 1899, the brave sons of Linmouth ventured forth to the aid of the Forest Hall, which was in difficulty off Porlock. The events that followed command almost legendary status in the eyes of the RNLI. 
So exactly 100 years later, on January the 12th, 1999, a reenactment was undertaken. A century earlier, the raging sea prevented the lifeboat from being launched at Lynmouth. But believing a launch would be possible from Porlock Weir, the crew embarked on a monumental journey. They set about hauling the Louisa some 13 miles, including the ascent of Countisbury Hill and descent of Porlock Hill. But it was all worthwhile. The launch and the rescue were successfully achieved without loss of life. The appalling weather must have been booked to order. It certainly added authenticity to the day. Come on, lads. They did it a hundred years ago. We can do it again. Now, where were we? Oh yes, the trip to Watersmeet. Having descended from Linton to Lynmouth, there is an easy way to do this, or something for the more ambitious. Of course, you could go by car along Watersmeet Road, or walk alongside the East Lynn River, but then you wouldn't get the chance to appreciate these views from the Cleves. Suffice to say, this route is not for the faint-hearted, but Watersmeet itself is quite a reward. Here in the foreground is the Hoare Oak Water, which meets and merges with the East Lynn River as they both tumble down off Axmoor. Watersmeet House was completed for the Reverend W.S. Halliday in 1832. It originated as a secluded spring retreat and lodge for fishing and hunting, but is now owned by the National Trust, who use it as a shop and tea garden. It's a fabulous spot to drop by or to break a walk such as ours along the East Lynn River. Even at the height of summer, Watersmeet doesn't get too crowded. Although you may get the odd mad dog, or even mad Englishman who doesn't fancy using the footbridges. See, there's some substance to that madness theory, although at least the water is nice and clear. There's one born every minute, you know. We resume our upstream journey along the banks of the East Lynn towards Rockford, where the treats of nature will jolly you along. Rockford itself is a beautiful sylvan setting, and across the footbridge, there's a pub. Well, I wouldn't want you to get too dehydrated. 
But here too, you may be lucky enough to see a certain shy creature lurking by one of the rock pools. But you'd best be quiet. You're in luck. Tucked away in the trees is the lesser spotted angler. Seriously though, the East Lynn River offers good fishing for salmon, sea trout and brown trout. Although, you'll have to compete with the herons. They're the real professionals round here. But nature will probably tolerate your intrusion for an hour or two. Whoops, I think we've been spotted. Either that, or he's getting dehydrated. Has he just been waiting for opening time? Walking or driving from Rockford, our next stop is the village of Brendan. Brendan's ancient Packhorse Bridge is so narrow that it's been replaced with this road bridge across the East Lynn River. Just like these ladies, we'll be making our way towards Malmesmead through the beautiful Brendan Valley. This is Malmesmead, with its picturesque old bridge and ford over Badgery Water, which many cars use as the bridge is so narrow. Exmoor's villages are so quaint, with roofs and walls clad with slate. Exmoor's dunes and rids lived here, and Blackmoor's books do they appear. Exmoor's peace and quiet abounds, the babbling brooks the only sounds. X is where more meets sea, Exmoor's the place to be. Armed with homemade ice creams, walking sticks and sturdy walking boots, intrepid visitors go in search of a little culture. The path to the Dune Valley starts at Malmesmead, the trip all the more rewarding when the streams are flowing well, or best of all, with the autumn colour change.
Maybe this is the water slide mentioned in the book Lorna Doon. Lorna Doon was written by R.D. Blackmore and first published in 1869. It became a huge success in late Victorian times, making Exmoor a fashionable holiday destination. Although it was widely held that the book Lorna Doon was pure fiction, it's since been proved that much of it was based on historic fact. And now, for some lovers of Blackmore's work, a visit here to Lank Coombe's water slide is almost a pilgrimage. After a pleasant walk up the Dune Valley, either via this, the easy route, or along the road, which is a little more undulating, the buttery at Mons Mead is a great place to stop for a cream tea. And the dog might even get a drink too, if he's lucky. Once fully refreshed, you'll pass the figures of Lorna and Carver Dune, before entering Somerset as we cross the river at Malmesmead for the short journey to Orr Church. This was another significant location from the Lorna Dune storyline. Inside Orr Church, Lorna was reputedly shot by Carver Doon during her marriage to Jan Ridd, Blackmore's words bringing the drama alive. On the walls, a commemorative plaque remembers both Reverend Halliday, who built Cluniven and Lymouth in 1826, and the Glenthorne Estate and House in 1830, and alongside a heartfelt tribute to R.D. Blackmore reads, Insight and humour and the rhythmic roll of antique lore. His fertile fancy swayed, and with their various eloquence arrayed his sterling English, pure and clean and whole. He added Christian courtesy and the humility of all thoughtful minds to a certain grand and glorious gift of radiating humanity. Continuing east along the Brendan Valley, we pass over Robber's Bridge, an idyllic spot where the owners of Bisto chose to have a picnic. Here too, the road bridge is a bit of a slim fit, so the ford through Weir Water is still used. Ah, Bisto. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. We seem to have stumbled into the rush hour on the Orr to Porlock Road. Beyond Porlock itself is Rose Cottage in Bossington. Its curved walls and round chimneys were built this way because local stone could not be trimmed into square blocks. Roses and hollyhocks abound in this picturesque Somerset village, which is a little off the beaten track. The neighbouring village of Allerford is also well worth a look, as is Selworthy.
Alaford's famous picture postcard Packhorse Bridge is a favourite location for photographers. So were these thatched cottages, were built in the 19th century by Sir Thomas Ackland for the aged and infirm of the Hanukkah estate, and are now owned by the National Trust. Further down the village, Selworthy Longhouse is one of Exmoor's oldest buildings, whilst Periwinkle Cottage is renowned for its cream teas. Sir Thomas based his model village on typical settlements of the area, but there's one distinct difference. Selworthy's deep thatched roofs, eyebrow dormers and lofty chimneys are pleasantly homogenous. Above the village, at the top of Selworthy Coombe, All Saints Church commands an impressive position. Its lime-washed walls, whilst protecting its stone, also make it stand out from the lush green landscape. Our visit coincided with the annual flower festival. The building, complete with fine aisled nave, largely dates from the 14th to 15th century, but the gallery is an 18th century addition. Looking south from the churchyard, one can see on the skyline Dunkery Beacon, which is the highest point on Exmoor at 1,704 feet. That's uh, 519 metres for you modern types. Dunkery Beacon itself commands views of the rugged Exmoor country as far as the North Devon coastline. The moorland colours so vivid that many well-known photographers and artists are enticed here to capture the natural beauty. The sturdy Exmoor ponies have long since added to the magic of the moor and can still be seen in many areas of the National Park. They are a thoroughbred breed, only found wild on Exmoor. Back in the 1800s, they were used as working ponies in the Brendan Hill iron ore mines, but now they enjoy a much more leisurely lifestyle. Returning to the coast, we reach Porlock Weir. Porlock and this tiny harbour village, which was formed when the sea retreated, both nestle below Porlock Hill, with Exmoor overshadowing them. This grew to be a busy port for large sailing ships until the harbour silted up, but the subsequent picturesque tranquility has attracted many a movie maker. Films such as The Feast of July feature Porlock Weir.
Our return to Lynmouth is via the Coast Road and the County Gate, the county boundary between Somerset and Devon. Down in the valley is Malmesmead and the road from Brendan, which we ventured along earlier. To reach this lovely spot, we've climbed from Porlock Weir via the toll road to Culborne, from where, if you follow the coast path, you'll find the smallest church in England. From the Exmoor National Park Visitor Centre behind us, you can either go back down to Brendan, park the car and just go for a wander through the heather and gorse, or head for Lynmouth via the coastal footpath or road. Perhaps your final port of call could be the Iron Age Hill Fort on the top of Countisbury before the descent into Lynmouth. Far below is Sillery Sand, the southwest coast path rounding the foreland to reach Lynmouth, whilst the road descends at 1 in 5. Not something we'd encourage cyclists to try. But then again, surely the challenge is uphill. Hard though it is to believe, local runners organise the Mad Mile, a race up Countersbury Hill from Lynmouth. It's strictly for the gently unhinged, as this is even a stiff climb for vehicles. Day trippers from Minehead return home in vintage style, whilst we complete our second round trip crossing the East Lynn at the foot of Countersbury Hill. Ahead is the even more daunting Lynmouth Hill, whilst at its foot is one of the do it yourself fountains of another popular attraction. The Glenlyn Gorge on the West Lynn River houses the exhibition of the power of water, which includes a hydroelectric power station feeding into the national grid. Visitors experience the power in numerous displays above the West Lynn, whilst the river itself falls vertically many hundreds of feet, allowing a large head of water to pass over the turbine, and thus the force of Mother Nature herself is harnessed. In fact, Lynmouth's first hydroelectric scheme was way back in the 1800s, Linton and Lynmouth boasting electric street lighting before London, green power long before such things were fashionable. And so, as evening descends, we find ourselves back in Lynmouth, where, just like Linton, there are plenty of places to get a good meal. And you may just be lucky enough to benefit from one of those evenings when the twin villages are at their best. The community spirit leads to many a function, particularly in the summer months. So with surf up and the sun setting, let's see what's going on down on the Manor Green. the distinct pleasure of the management to present to you the evening star attraction. Here they are, back from their exclusive tour of Europe, Scandinavia, and the Southern Continent. Won't you welcome the show band of Joliet Jake and Elwood Blues, the Blues Brothers.
so glad to see so many of you lovely people here tonight. We would especially like to welcome all the members of Devon's Law Enforcement Community who have chosen to join us here at this time. We do sincerely hope you enjoyed the show. And please remember, people, that no matter who you are or what you do to live, thrive, and survive, there are some things that make us all the same. Indeed, everybody does need someone to love, and we all need somewhere to love too. As for me, I can't wait for my next trip to England's little Switzerland. Maybe I'll see you there.